This episode of Reasonably Spontaneous Conversations is brought to you in part by In Search of the New Compassionate Male. For more information, go to newcompassionatemale.com. Hello, David. Hi, Dennis. What a pleasure to both to meet you and to do it. First of all, I want to know, I'm looking at the spelling of your name. In my head, I've been saving Stevens, but it looks like it's Stephens. Oh, Stevens is correct. Yes. Ah, okay. Yeah. And so, so why would it be Stevens uh, from? That I don't know. I don't know the origin of the <laughs> PH versus the V. I, <laughs> I all right. So, David, let me ask you something. I, I, I've been looking at your blog. I've been looking at all your all, all your work and your puppetry. I want to know where where the both music and puppetry intersected with David Stevens as a child. Oh wow! Those those aspects of that. To what what was what were the germs that got so build us on those stories and then we'll come up to the present. Sure. There are a couple of different places. I think uh, for the puppetry, uh, I was certainly influenced by the work of Jim Henson on Sesame Street and the Muppets. And that probably also had a lot to do with my musical influence, too, because in, in both of those uh, shows, uh, the music is, is very heavy oh. uh, and very different stylistically, too. Uh, but I also grew up in church. Uh, in a, my dad's a Southern Baptist preacher, so I grew up with old, old Baptist hymns. And so... He would listen to the uh, the country station on the radio, so that's where some of that influence came in. I really didn't get into bluegrass necessarily until I was much older, till I was in college and started playing music and, on my and own. And what year? What year were you in college? Uh, let's see. That would have been 1995, I think, yeah. is when I started playing guitar, and then I started playing banjo the year later, so in '96. Good. What attracted because you've you've been you've made quite a name for yourself with the banjo. So what attracted you? Hold up the instrument to oh, you sure, and, sure. and tell me tell me the story of this particular guy. Oh, this banjo has a great story. Uh, so this is a 1929 Gibson Style Three. Uh, it's a conversion. It started its life as a tenor banjo uh, when it left the uh, Gibson factory. Uh, it went to uh, Forbes Piano Company in Birmingham, Alabama, where a gentleman <laughs> bought it uh, in 1929. He immediately pawned it. Uh, then uh, a fellow, uh, the fellow that I bought it from, his uncle went into this pawn shop about three or four times and kept bugging the guy about this banjo. And finally, the pawnbroker sold it to him for $50. Uh, and then uh, the, the guy that I bought it from inherited it from that uncle. And then uh, that gentleman, uh, he uh, developed Parkinson's and couldn't play anymore. So he was looking for somebody to buy his banjo. And I had a buddy who was uh, in touch with him and said, I, I think there's a banjo you might be interested in. Well, he called me after I purchased the banjo and come to find out he was friends with my grandparents. So it was this really nutty story of this banjo sort of staying in the family. So it was it was meant to be, I think. What makes a great banjo? How how do how do you tell that it that is a quality instrument? It's something that that you really want to own. Uh, how much you pay for it? No. <laughs> <laughs> uh, there are a lot of things, but usually it just depends depends on your personal preference, like yeah. the tone of the instrument, uh, how it's set up. Uh, there there are a lot of things that go into uh banjos like the, how they're set up uh how tight yeah. the head is because this is essentially a drum uh how you know some people like uh, a higher action on the strings or a lower action on the strings so there are all sorts of things that you can sort of tweak Got about it. a banjo and get it to your preference but a lot of times it just has to do with the voice of the instrument that being you know the tone that you like and the quality that you like some banjos tend to, to be on the more treble end of things, and then some, depending on the woods that are used uh, for the resonator and, and things. Uh, and then some banjos have a good mid-range and low-range. And, yeah, so there are a lot of different things that go into what makes a, a banjos different uh, and, and, and uh, set apart from each other. Well, when you got out of school, were you committed to a musical career, an artistic career, or what, 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 was, what was your bent? Uh, I was definitely uh, on on the road, well on the road to being a professional puppeteer. That that was sort of locked in when I was a teenager. I, I kind of knew that that's what I wanted to do with my life. And I uh, yes. was making puppets by the time I was in middle school and 
was doing shows by the time I was in high school. And so when I went to college, it was for dramatic arts, uh, but with an emphasis on puppetry. And so when I went to graduate school, it was for puppet arts at the University of Connecticut. And uh, so I, I was dead focused on being a professional puppeteer. So, so you looked up puppet arts and found a university and UConn is amazing. And it said, this well, is... I, how that happened, I was a part of, I was a member of an organization called the Puppeteers of America. Uh, and I would go to their festivals, which happened during the summers and even years, they would have a, a, a regional festival and odd number of years, they would have a, a national festival. And it was through meeting different puppeteers at these festivals that I became acquainted with the program at UConn and uh, met their director, Bart Rockaburton, one year in, I think, 93. Mm -hmm. And uh, from that meeting, it, it sort of set my course for, I wanted to go there for undergraduate school, but UConn's a, it's not a cheap school. <laughs> so I, it waited until I could go to grad and, uh, and I had really concentrated time. I, I did my grad work in three semesters and then graduated and, and then started my company, All Hands Productions. But yeah, it was through that organization that I came to know about the puppet arts program. So UConn and there's a program in West Virginia. And I think those are really the only two programs uh, that are geared specifically with, with puppet emphasis. You know, uh, when your family, when you said to your family, I want to make my life in, in doing and showing puppets and doing this around, you know, not chemical engineering, not, but <laughs> I want to do this, especially being a PK and being able to, what, uh, how was that reaction? They, they knew by that point because the Muppets had been such a, a part of my life. And, and I was an obsessive no fan. Like I, I, was, I was completely obsessed by them uh, and with them. And so puppets were just, they, they were an ever-present fixture in, in daily life for me and, and no. subsequently my parents. So it, it came as no surprise to them that, uh, that it, it wasn't just a passing fancy for me. It wasn't just something that I was into like everybody was into and then moved on. Uh, for whatever reason, uh, it, it really planted a seed in me that uh, that just grew into this. You know, it was a, an obsession that turned into a hobby that became a career, essentially. Uh, and, you know, I think it actually helped with my dad's profession because he certainly followed an avocation. He followed his calling uh, just as I felt called to do the work that I'm doing. Uh, so I think there were a lot of parallels. I can imagine. So, all right. So you start off and you start this company to be able to do, what is your vision? I mean, uh, the, the the Sesame Street and Henson is still going and the, the company oh, yes. is still going at that time, you know, and so there's going, I mean, did you want to join? I mean, I know you spent a lot of time in there, but how, how did you get into the, into the stream of being, having this? Because one of the things that, that uh, Renee Jaworski, our COO and, and the, of, of the network and I are, one of the goals that we're doing is that we want to be able to support ourselves as working artists. Mm. And we happen to be visual artists and we want right. to be able to do that. And well, I, I do. Renee is, has much broader focus than I. But in in that, to be supported as a working artist, that that was our vision. And how did you, uh, was that the, the way to enter that as a? Uh, for me, I think what really helped me out was starting very young uh, because I was still doing performances while I was a student. So by the mm -hmm. time I was doing it full time, I had a roster of, of people I'd already been doing shows for and sort of made nice. that eased into it. Uh, I didn't have to just plunge right into, into, into doing this with, with no, with nothing uh, or start from zero. Uh, so that, that I think helped me a lot. Uh, but I've also had to work on uh, sort of recontextualizing where I do what I do. And most of what I do are family uh, geared performances there. Uh, I sort of describe them like the Muppets meet Rocky and Bullwinkle. They're, uh, they're fractured fairy tales mostly. Uh, each show has its own set of characters. Uh, the ones that you see behind me are sort of just random characters from, from other things that aren't really in my, uh, my, my family shows. Right. Uh, but so each of those shows are, you know, they're written in such a way that they're layered. There's plenty of stuff in there for grownups as much as there is for kids. Uh, and they're, they're not didn't necessarily any way they're, they're very sort of entertaining for entertainment value. Uh, 
Uh, I agree. Uh, and that's yeah. one of the things I that I so respected about the Muppets is they never talked down to children. Right, right. You always, I mean, children's and great children's entertainment is great entertainment. It is right. not dumbed down. And much of that had to do with the writing of Jerry Jewell, who was the Muppets head writer for years and years. And he was uh, wow. he was an expert at that. He was just a brilliant writer who knew how to how to write in those layers. Uh, and that was the magic of what that was, is because it didn't uh, it, it didn't target a specific audience. It was meant to be for a whole experience for every anybody who watched it um, and, and, every, and everybody who watched it got something different out of it, too. Exactly. Uh, and so that's what I hope I accomplish in my work. Uh, so I have I do shows that preschoolers can get along with as as well as their 90 year old grandmother, you know, because oh, I wonderful. The, the old folks have to come to the shows, too. So I might as well not you know, might as well include them and in, in being entertained. So and, and I think it's more enriching that way. I see so much out there that's, you know, specifically targeted for a very, very specific age, like stuff that's geared only for three year olds and anybody right. who's not three. You know, it's not really meant for them. And it's so limiting. Like it's, I, I've never really understood that philosophy outside of a, no. like marketing research or just targeted uh, uh, sales. <laughs> exactly. Uh, so would you pull, pull one uh, of your puppets over? Because I want to talk. Yeah. Sure. I'll get Chubbly over here. So Chubbly, uh, Chubbly. is a sort of main major character that I use for things. Yes. I'm all over the internet. Hello, Chubbly. It's a pleasure to meet you. I know that uh, I, I, it's difficult sometimes for me. I mean, I hope you understand that it's not that I am, uh, well, I have nothing against puppets. It's just that I don't I hope know. Not. I'm on your show. Well, I know that, but it's just that I don't know a lot of you. So I want you to be, oh. if, if I am, if I do anything that is not uh, uh, PC, puppet correct, I want you to make sure. I, I know. I know. I just. I need you to, to correct me and help me to. Oh boy. Okay. Uh, just, and just you help ask me, me. Questions, Dennis. So ask me a question. Uh, right. Uh, all right. So here's here's the thing that I want to know is that. Okay. When did you know? And I, now I actually I need to ask David this. Oh, David, oh, oh, you, when yeah. did Chubbly go from being a puppet to being alive to you? How, talk. Oh. Can you talk about that process with? Chubbly with you there. I mean, you need to know your origin stories. I don't want to know that part. Uh, <laughs> okay, we're talking about the we're talking about the birds and the and the moths. Well, it's uh, right. It's it's the it's character development, and that's uh, and so I, I design and build all the puppets that I perform. So it's not like I'd buy these from somebody else or somewhere like that. These are uh, all. Uh, they all come from my imagination and then they're realized in three dimension all by my right. doing. So uh, I don't know. They, the, the character sort of forms uh, as I'm developing them. So sometimes I start out with a very, uh, when I'm sketching something, if I'm doing a design for a character, that's when the kernel and the sort of gem of the, of the character sort of formalizes. And Got sometimes it. they emerge. Now, Chubbly, uh, his origin story uh, I, th he's the fur that's on him was textured in such a way that it made it this whole crinkle texture. What are you talking about? <laughs> well, you see, this fur started out very straight and shiny and sleek, and then there's this process by which you can boil the fur. Ooh. Boil the fur? Yeah, we <laughs> saw this fur was boiled uh, before it was put on him. <laughs> And uh, and so that's how this texture gets achieved. And so it was purely out of a, a an experiment to see how that technique was done. And then I had this fur and uh, decided to make this character. Um, and so do I just you, had. Do you get mm -hmm. into it when, when you're in front of an audience and you begin to get? Do you see a time when they when you actually have them when you realize that they have bought into the entire bought, bought into the entire story? Sure. Most of the time, you know, I'm not seen. I'm I'm very. Uh, I'll be below the the playboard, so I'm working with puppets over my head. Uh, but ah. usually, it's, so it's audible. I can tell they're with me by their their uh, audible reactions to things. So they're either laughing or they're there's some participation where I'll ask them to say something or do something. And so if they are heartily participating or just engaged, I can tell. Uh, and you can also tell when they're not. <laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> the, 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 and do, do you find that, 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 that Chubbly, that, yes. that Chubbly, do you, do you enjoy 
performing and enjoy performing for the people our ages. Was this something that you feel like you were born to do? Oh yes, absolutely. I'm 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 made to uh, to entertain and make people happy. Oh yes. Oh, that is that is that is absolutely lovely. All right, well, Chubbly, thank you so much. Thank you for, oh, for joining us on that. You, you Don't go questions? too far. Well, oh, I, okay. I, I All do, right, I'll, I'll, be, I'll be over here on yeah. the side of this table. Okay. <laughs> All right, fine. Thank you. And and when you when you work, one of the, one of our uh, one of our dear uh, friends and one of our our head writer uh, Graham Bullen is working on a novel from the. <clears throat> late 1400s oh, wow. called the puppet master oh, which is wow. all about puppetry in in italy during that time but it was all with strings and sure. working with that and making them come alive mm -hmm. and and so this process of actually making it go from an inanimate object to an animate object is right. magic yeah, it is. Uh, and, you know, there are different styles of puppets for sure. Like Chubbly, these, most of these guys are Muppet style so that my hand's in there operating the mouth like that. So there's very direct control. Uh, and the same for, uh, so I got one back here, uh, these sort of traditional hand puppets, these glove mm -hmm. puppets like Mr. Punch is this kind of puppet. Mm -hmm. uh, so he doesn't have a moving mouth necessarily, but he, you know, has the, there's still the direct control of your hand inside the thing to get it to look around or move his hands like that. Right. Uh, so with marionettes present uh, some real challenges because you have such a, a distance between uh, the puppet itself and the uh, and the performer. This is sure. a, this is a, one of my little creations called a dowling, uh, and it's a type of string puppet. It's got a rod that goes from the control to its head, but then his legs uh, and hands are controlled by strings. So most of this is just made to <laughs> look wacky like that. <laughs> but so there's a, a real distance between where my hand is and the puppet. Uh, and that's true for, you know, traditional string marionettes too. Yeah. Uh, so it becomes really difficult to, uh, to uh, have that transference of control uh, where it's, it's a, you know, transferring that character all the way down through those strings. And yeah, so it is a real challenge. It is, and and but that's what I see you. That, that's what I see you doing as you're, as you're working through that. Now, do you bring music into your into your your shows also? I do. Uh, so it's hard for me to do both at the same time. <laughs> yeah, I can imagine. <laughs> to play an instrument and do a puppet. So usually, what happens is the show will start out with me playing the banjo and and singing a song that has something to do with the show they're going to see, uh, and then I get on to the regular puppet show. Uh, so I do try to include. Uh, playing live music in the, in the shows. If I had, you know, more hands, I, I, it would be easier to do, but to do both yeah. simultaneously, but. <laughs> well, why don't, why, why don't you pick up that banjo and sure. play us something since you're, since you're already teasing us with that, why don't you do, give me a little of the history of what you're about to play. Uh, well, I'll play, uh, this is a, this is a breakfast song. It's a song about my favorite uh, breakfast food, which is, uh, you, you find prevalently down here in the South. It goes like this. Well, just get some gravy. Come on, baby, why don't you make me some biscuits and gravy? Now put away your bacon. You keep your grits as breakfast foods go. They are the piss. Only one thing that's gonna save me, and that's another plate of your biscuits and gravy. Yeah, biscuits and gravy. Come on, baby, why don't you make me some biscuits and gravy? Put them on a pan, stick them in the oven. There's one sure way to guarantee my loving. As long as you make them, I'll never stray. So come on and make me some biscuits and gravy. Yeah, biscuits and gravy. Come on, baby, why don't you make me some biscuits and gravy? Saving out these biscuits hard love would fall apart that my stomach loves you more than my heart let's talk it over while you feel this way over another plate of biscuits and gravy yeah, biscuits and gravy come on baby why don't you make me some biscuits and gravy
Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> sure. I mean, this, is, this is out of the South. And, and do you, oh, yes. you have a, you have a sense of, uh, when I ask, when I ask uh, Stevie Ray Vaughan about this, he said that the music is in the dirt. Oh, it yeah. comes out of the it comes out of that and do, do you feel a sense of your your music coming out of out of this uh, both out of the south and because the south is going through some incredible evolutionary changes right now it's really coming yeah. into a different and and it's not always the smoothest ride oh no no it, the transitions are never easy and usually pretty bumpy uh but yeah i mean i do find that um a lot of the things i write about are are just part of uh, my experience being in the South and sort of, uh, you know, I am a Southerner, but I, you know, I've also, I spent a great a good deal of time in the North too. I lived in New York for a while. I went to grad school in Connecticut. So yep. I've experienced some other places and come back. And so it's, it was one of those things that when I was a kid, there were a lot of things about Southern culture that I wasn't, you know, necessarily, uh, I didn't want to exist in. Like I couldn't wait to exactly. sort of get out of it. And then I got out of it and I realized how much of it was sort of part of me uh the best parts i think the storytelling aspect for sure i think that's pretty steeped in in southern culture uh as far as being storyteller and that's kind of what the songwriting is i mean the music and the puppets and all of it is just sort of connected to, to storytelling in general wonderful uh, so i think that's part of a, a long southern tradition that i'm a part of what stories are you looking to tell what are you what's on your writing desk that is in the germis germ phases that you can share so i learn a little bit about your creative process oh gosh well you know i really uh <laughs> I, I, you put me on the spot i haven't i don't really have a new show that i'm working on right now uh the last thing that i really did was to do a lot of things with the dowling characters they were sort of my pandemic uh <laughs> They were sort of my pandemic renaissance, I guess. Yeah. And I made a whole bunch of little videos with them. Uh, I'm still open to to finding stories, but I find that it gets, uh, the older I get, the more difficult it becomes to find material that I really latch on to. And because uh, I have about six, I think six different touring shows that are in my stable right now. And, and they're all, you know, the, uh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> the last one I did was a few years ago called The Pied Picker. Uh, and it's a uh, it's a spin on the Pied Piper, but he's a banjo player, uh, and instead of rats, they're a bunch of roaches. <laughs> so, <laughs> uh, so are you it, doing yeah. a lot of a lot of your work on television? Are you doing it all uh, now that we're coming a little bit out of the pandemic? I mean, you, do you want to? Are you going back into the to the show realm? What, what what's the arc? Well, I'm trying to figure that out, actually, uh, because of the pandemic. I, I really haven't worked in the TV industry in a good long while. I, I guess it's been about 10 years since I've, I've done, I think, uh, anything with, with television and about 12 years, I guess, since I was uh, briefly a puppeteer on Sesame Street. So it's been a good long time uh, since I've done any of that legit industry work. Uh, so most of what I have been doing since that time has been live touring shows in schools, libraries, performance venues. Uh, here in Atlanta, we have the Center for Puppetry Arts, and I've been on their stage uh, pretty annually, actually. Uh, so as things are starting to open up, there's still a little bit of hesitancy. Uh, I have been doing a few more live shows as things are opening back up uh, in larger spaces, uh, but there's still, people are still sort of like, and now that they're, we keep coming up with variants, <laughs> It becomes every time I'm like biting my teeth, it's like, oh, are we going to close up again? Uh, so I'm because I'm I'm still trying to figure out my footing on this because uh, yeah, most of my bread and butter has been through live performances and getting paid for doing those. So if I don't have those to do, uh, <laughs> things become exactly. dicey around here. Uh, not that the puppets eat all that much, but I do. <laughs> so. Exactly. So that you're going ahead and taking taking care of it. So how? How do you do you plan out? Have you noticed have you noticed some some evolution in your own in your own process? Like like I, I loved your video on building on building mm -hmm. a puppet and, and your video on do, do, do you have a sense of where things are going uh, for you right now? You know, career wise, you mean? Yeah. Uh, no, <laughs> to put it simply, uh, I sort of like. I've I've always been of the minds that the the journey sort of carries me, and when one piece of work will carry me to another piece of work, and and hopefully it just you know the the journey unfolds as I'm on it, exactly. Uh, which may be a little naive, but that that just seems to be the way it's gone for me. Uh, so I I don't 
yeah, I, hopefully I'm just able to continue what I'm doing because I like the work that I do. I think aud- it resonates with audiences and, and, and they like it. Uh, but who knows? I mean, we'll see. Yeah. As, as long as the venues want me to be there, I'll be there. And there, there, it feels to me that you're, you're going to be getting an opportunity, uh, opportunities coming up because there, is, there is a hunger for. Would you be, would you be interested in doing a television show or being able to do a show like the, like the Muppets that has a, a story through? I mean, you've seen it. You've been there. You've been on the stage. You talk with yeah. the head writer. You talk with the writer. So you know the the complexity that it would be Absolutely. to do to do something like that. Does that impel you at all? You know, when I worked in television, I really liked having the performer role. Uh, the person who is the producer or the the creator of the thing has to wear, you know, like I wear a lot of hats already at doing my own work uh, in my solo company. But mm-hmm. it, it, you, you, there are a whole lot more hats that get added to the to the to your head when you get into the television realm. Oh wow! Uh, so yeah. I always felt more comfortable in that world as a as a performer. Uh, uh, yeah, it just. <laughs> I liked having the one role as exactly. opposed to all of the roles. And then, and then in that creator's chair, you really were, you, you're, you're a coordinator at that point. Uh, because yes, I think you still get like Jim Henson had the benefit of still being able to do performance while he was creating all the stuff that he did, but he also had to coordinate teams of people uh, to be able to successfully do the work that he did. And that was the people behind the scenes who were, building the puppets in the shop and that was his team of performers and that was the crew of people that you know ran the studios or you know worked in the studios uh, all the way down so it's like a, a small army that you have to lead uh, when you step into that realm of like of creating content for the industry god i can i, I can only imagine well t- take me back again to to when a character emerges, mm-hmm. do you start with an idea of who this character is going to be and then build it or build that around? Or do you start and play it? When does it become alive? I, I, I was. Yeah, uh, it, it, it happens in all kinds of ways. Sometimes it is because you have a very specific desire for a type of character and then you design around that sort of archetype of, of a person or a characteristic Uh, And then sometimes it it begins, sometimes it emerges as you're designing. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, sometimes it emerges as you're building the thing off of the design. Uh, So it, it, I like, I like the process best when it's organic. Uh, Typically I I don't necessarily like commission builds for other folks because I'll be given a design and then I'm just building something that has to look like the design that they've given me. And it's not necessarily, I don't necessarily know anything about the character or anything like that. It's just, here's here's a drawing, make it look like this. And it's, <laughs> it seems very impersonal. Uh, so yeah. I, I like building when I'm designing it and, and I, it sort of comes from my imagination because it's all sort of connected in that way. And it happens organically. Um, and like I said before, it can also change. Sometimes it can... Uh, the, the whole character of the thing can, you could make it and it can look like the design, but then the whole different personality comes out of it when you actually start to perform it. Uh, so I like it best in that way that, and that it happens organically and you don't try to force it uh, onto the, the, the character or the puppet or, or whatever. When you do your shows, do you do them by yourself? Oh yes. Yes. I'm a one man operation. <laughs> <laughs> it keeps the cost down. Well, uh, yes, yeah, I, can, so. I can understand. So that your puppet, and wh- where ha- where did you practice your accents, and where did you do? Because you really do some wonderful work with the, the with your British accent and your other. Oh, I mean, just a little <laughs> bit that I have seen. I mean, I'm going. Oh man, <laughs> Simon, I have accent. Simon's in the... pretty new. Like doing his voice, I was always real hesitant. I I built Simon Twildberry, the little glove puppet, yeah. back there during the pandemic, and it was purely a, just as a a, a a lark to to build a puppet. And then I, when I would play with him in the in the studio, I, I he would develop that little I, what I wanted to be a British accent, and uh, and so but I never shot anything with him because I was always really afraid of like you know. Mm, I, <laughs> Uh, but then I did a little piece with him recently where he did speak, and, and I think it was okay, but oh, you yeah. know, I don't it know. Came, I, did, it, I watched it, a lot of cartoons when I was a kid, and so yeah. a lot of it just came out of trying to emulate the voices that I heard on on TV. 
Well, so, you, you you mentioned when when I, when I got into, uh, of course, I came through the. I got a chance to interview Mel Blank, and I got a, oh, and wow. to be able to work through that. And I will send you a link to that and put a link yeah. on your on, on your on your show if you're interested. But the sure. the to to be able to see. But I intersected. I left the, the the Looney Tunes and the and the cartoon world until I hit Rocky and Bullwinkle, mm. and suddenly everything changed. Did that happen with you with them? You know, I was certainly aware of them. Of course, I grew up in the eighties, so uh, oh, that would have been much. Uh, you're, you're right. Yeah. That was Ren and Stimpy, and and right, which I didn't see because I didn't have cable. I I lived way out in in the boonies in Alabama, and they would not run cable out where we were because in those days you had to have enough cable subscribers to warrant them running the cable. Uh, so it wasn't until I would go visit my grandparents in the summer that they lived in more metropolitan areas, and so they had cable. And then I just gorged. I like watched whatever I could. Uh, so really what I had was limited to what came on Saturday mornings. And then uh, the UHF stations ran cartoons early in the morning on the weekdays. Uh, but so, I, yeah, I remember things like Heckle and Jekyll and Deputy Dog and Mighty Mouse and that that whole, mm -hmm. I, I guess I was, was that United Artists? That, that, I, that I whole, think so. Yeah, they did. Yeah. And then Hanna-Barbera had a whole yeah. stable with you, you with the, with the uh, anyway, they had a whole set. Yeah, so it was. Those were the things that I kind of grew up on, and uh, so it wasn't. I didn't get the 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 Nickelodeon stuff until much later, and then in just limited forms. So yeah, how cool. Well, what what haven't we talked about that's on your mind or on your on on your heart today? Hmm. David? Well, uh, well, I, I if I if I can do a shameless plug, you know, besides the oh, shows, please, that I do, we are shameless. <laughs> we we are absolutely shameless. Please plug. Well, Besides all the shows that I do, uh, several years ago, I started making uh, making product, basically. So I have an Etsy store where I have different puppets and plush things. Uh, years ago, I, I saw a, uh, an HGTV show, I think it was, where somebody made a plush animal. Mm -hmm. And it was pretty rudimentary and simple. And I thought, you know what, I can do better than that. And so I designed these uh, these rabbit, these plush rabbits. And so some of these are in the Etsy store. And then... Oh. Uh, so yeah, and then I have uh, there's a monkey too. So there's monkeys blue. This is a blue monkey, and uh, and yeah, and then I developed uh, earlier this year I developed these thing called boondoggles, uh, and that's uh, they they have absolutely no purpose even though it seems that they do. <laughs> uh, oh. So that's these are these are all plush, and then I have puppets too. Uh, so I have these things called flat-footed frizzles. Uh, apparently there's somebody using these on TikTok now. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so uh, they, they these seem to be pretty popular with folks. And then uh, I also have little Fazinger. These are finger puppets. So let's get them on here. Little Fazinger finger puppets. And then uh, the only thing I have a, a patent on, I have a design patent for this thing called a Glarf, which is a scarf. That is also a puppet. So <laughs> one hand goes in the head and one hand goes in this hand here. And, and then you get a puppet, a, a, a puppet that will keep you warm and hopefully keep you entertained. Yes. Oh, so. <laughs> well, may, well, may all these puppets keep you warm. Absolutely. Because we are being entertained because there is, there is a way, one of the things that doing do I don't know that is uh, when we when we talk with artists and and actors and entertainers nobody can just sit back and be okay I'm going to be this one thing right. we have to be able to diversify and we have to be able and and that's what we're seeing and in any way that we can we can publicize you I mean I would love to get one of those first puppets that you had and get him a little TMN T-shirt a little Tardom <laughs> Media Network T-shirt and to have that on there and to have you sure. as uh, uh, and so, anyway, I, we will talk. We, I will see what make, get a onesie and get a, get Judge some kind Charlie of. Charlie will be glad to wear it. <laughs> yeah, and to be 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 able to do that, and we can uh, connect to your uh, to your Etsy store so that people sure. will people will be able to do that. Oh, thank you, David. Thank you so thank much you, for it's giving been a real me. Treat. Uh, for giving me time to be able to know uh, to know your creative uh, purpose and what we're doing and and Chubbly to be able to to give him uh, 
Chablis, yes, give you give me air time. I'll take all of it. I, I, I'm sorry. I didn't mean to talk about it, but I am talking to you. Chubbly, okay. thank you for coming by and well, spending some time some time with us. I I, I hope that uh, I hope that we that we gave you a good uh, a good airing today and 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 made sure that you felt heard. Oh yes, uh, yes, I absolutely. I feel I feel heard and listened to and appreciated. Wonderful, you, Chubbly. My pleasure, Chubbly. And David, thank you so much. And and thank audience, you. audience, thank you so much. Remember, it's David's Etsy store. We're going to have have that a link prominent on the page on <laughs> on the show page because Get we want to make before sure. Christmas. Damn right. All right. Thank you so much, <laughs> sir. And we will see you, and we'll see everyone next time. Thank you. Bye bye. This episode of Reasonably Spontaneous Conversations has been brought to you in part by In Search of the New Compassionate Male. For more information, go to newcompassionatemail.com.